This podcast is sponsored by Dust Element. Frustrated with your asset library? Is it slow, unorganized, and outdated? The VFX asset library software Dust Element is just what you need. Built with high industry standards, Dust Element is the smart solution to organize your VFX elements. The tool is fully customizable and adapts existing workflows as well as naming conventions. Check out www.dust-element.com for more info or a personal live demo. Hi everyone, welcome to the Befores and Afters podcast. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters. Today we're chatting about something a little bit different, and that is immersive experiences. In this case, it's the science fiction Voyage to the Edge of Imagination exhibition at the Science Museum in London. This experience opened in October this year and was designed by Framestore. For the podcast, I talked to a couple of members of the team at Framestore behind the work. Creative Director Gavin Fox, Creative Director and Writer Henry Trotter, and Lauren Anderson, Executive Producer for Immersive at Framestore. This is certainly not the usual befores and afters podcast, in that we're not going to be talking about the VFX of the project, but instead about the creative direction, even the making of an entire language for the experience itself. I think it's a really interesting side to the other kinds of work that Framestore does. So let's jump in now with Gavin, Henry and Lauren. Well, hi guys. Um, Great to see you on Zoom here. I'm really excited about talking about a project that isn't necessarily diving into visual effects, modeling, animating, rigging, compositing. This feels like so much more of a creative thing. Gavin, maybe starting with you, can you give me a bit of background about how this project even came to Framestore? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is the reason it came around is the Science Museum were looking to do this exhibition about science fiction. Um, They wanted it to be a much more immersive, interactive world building experience than they've done previously. Um, And they, they generally wanted to be like, unlike something they've done before, unlike something they've seen before. So they were deliberately looking for partners to work with, which haven't worked with them or haven't done this kind of more traditional museum exhibition space work. They wanted to work with us because we are more storytellers and we're more world builders rather than like educators. So that was why it came to us. Henry, what had Framestore done previously in terms of any kind of museum or immersive experiences? I mean, I'm so familiar with the visual effects side of Framestore, but there's also a whole lot of other things that people might not always realize the studio does. Yes, well, we have a whole um, uh, team that's devoted to immersive experiences, and and actually, in some ways, Gavin and Lauren are probably better better equipped to tell you about specific um, projects. But we've done we, we've even made experiences for museums before, um, and obviously, a, um, a lot of the immersive work we do is, it, you know, it's devoted to creating an experience. It's it's focused on on you know on what an audience how an audience will experience a story, how we tell that story to the audience, how we immerse them in that experience. And, you know, obviously those are the things that the that the, that the Science Museum was particularly interested in tapping into for for their science fiction um, uh, experience. But actually, I, I, I think Gavin at least would be better able to tell you some of the things. I mean, some of the things he and I have worked on together, but um, and also I'm, I'm a bit nervous because I don't know which ones we're allowed to talk about and which ones we're not. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead, Gavin. that. Yeah, so um, yeah, as 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 Henry rightly says, we have like an immersive team that specialises in these type of immersive projects. And immersive is a bit of a, a catch-all phrase. I wish there was a better phrase we can stop using that word all the time. We're still yet to find a new word for immersive. But um, yeah, the, I mean the things that I normally do, and myself and Lauren and like I've worked with Henry on quite a few of these things day to day is more like theme park attractions mm. um, and these kind of world building um, ideas. And so that's the the kind of challenges that we've met on those projects that we brought to this is the idea of how do you tell a story um, that involves suddenly 12 tourists going through it and how do you make that story 
quite often the theme park attractions we do um, like we've done five Jurassic World attractions for Universal for example um, and so how do you tell a very well known story um, in a new way that the guests still going to be surprised at what happens within that story um, and a story which doesn't upset the main canon of the storyline that you see in the movies or in the video games or in the books or you know all these IPs that we deal with um, we have to be careful that we make sure we weave a story in amongst them that feels new and fresh and still has surprises and still exciting but also importantly has the nostalgia of seeing those elements that you're you know and love from the IPs that we're talking about so that's very appropriate for the science museum in the way that we were devising a, a brand new science fiction story we wanted it to feel and the museum wanted it to echo the idea of fanship the fan nature of science fiction and to be excited about it and to show the idea of world building is one of the major parts of a science fiction storyline um so we devised this story which does put the guests in the center of the the actual the core of the storyline but in amongst it we've done it in such a way that you tend to walk past nostalgic elements or new elements whether it's movie props or whether it's scientific discoveries they're all in amongst the same storyline and so that was that was our big challenge is, is to make that happen and, and it's interesting lauren because one of the things the reasons i wanted to talk to you guys about this was to get away from always talking about visual effects but here you had to think about so many things as um gavin's mentioning you know lighting sound design what people would walk past how do you contemplate all those things when you're designing one of these um, experiences i mean as Gavin mentioned we always start with sort of the experience and the narrative and we think about the guests or the visitors and how they're going to move through the space and you know, what we want them to take away from it and then it's it's kind of broken down into component parts from that. What's really interesting about this project is we partnered with uh, a Dutch design company called PMP Projects, who um, brought that sort of traditional design and build arm to help us develop and, and sort of realize the creative concepts and the narrative that we were designing. Um, that's been a really interesting partnership for us. And it meant that we as well as doing the creative development and the concepts and the narrative and lighting design, sound design, we were able to work with them along the actual physical design process all the way through to like detailed design packages and specifying materials and finishes. So the frame store has been able to have sort of involvement in everything in that exhibition. Um, whereas some of the previous projects that we've worked on, we might not have been able to have that sort of overarching creative influence all the way through all the different components that we work on um so yeah it's it's been really fantastic in that sense to be able to uh, to hold on to that creative vision that's that's come from gavin and henry and the team and just make sure it's applied absolutely everywhere throughout everything that you see and do within it henry before we started talking someone mentioned that you've been on this project for something like three years is that about right that is true. I mean, obviously, there are there have been ups and downs in the in the over the course of that. We've had a you know a, a science fiction like <laughs> worldwide pandemic um, uh, that that intervened. Uh, um, but yes, the the initial development started uh, um, about three years ago, and uh, and obviously at that point it was quite conceptual. Uh, we were talking a lot about how do we achieve the goals that the science museum had sort of set for themselves even how did how how you know those goals developed in, in that initial um kind of uh concepting phase you know and and they've taking their idea of you know the 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 starting point of saying we want to create um a science fiction exhibition that's also an experience that 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 will that will draw people in um because it's immersive then that was their that was their starting point, but then they were kind of thinking, well, what's the story that we want to tell in that context? How do we want that story to evolve? And we worked with them quite closely to develop that for probably well, it was months, <laughs> possibly possibly more than months, but it was it was a while, and you know, and obviously that was it's a very unusual uh, it's a very unusual way of approaching an exhibition. It's a very unusual thing to do, even for an immersive experience, because. There were genuine sort of scientific educational even goals that they had 
but they wanted to not put them forward in a kind of traditional way where they just had a series of kind of learning objectives that were laid out. They wanted to, to try and create a story that embodied those um, objectives. And, and that's where we kind of, we came into it and we, you know, we developed what that story would be, how that story would achieve their goals. We, you know, we, we kind of, we followed that path through the, the, the evolution of those goals. So that was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to apologize for, for three years of development work, but actually I think a lot of the first part of that was, you know, it was, a, it was quite high level conceptual story focused um, work and as well as us sort of thinking, well, you know, if we have this opportunity, what can we what can we do as an experience? How can we create this as a, a you know a meaningful experience, a rewarding experience, an experience that's actually that people will enjoy? There's definitely balancing a line, wasn't it? Because obviously we're pushing really hard from the story and the experience and the narrative point of view, but we have to take into account and, and work with the curatorial interpretation teams to make sure that their sort of their education and their core messaging from that point of view is coming across. So there were a lot of discussions that um, went on for, you know, as Henry said, for a, you know, a number of months about how, how we achieve both those things, how we maintaining sort of a really immersive guest experience, but we're still hitting all of the key sort of education and curatorial points that the Science Museum team wanted to get across. And, and then also developing a design language as well, which I'm sure Gavin would love to talk a little bit more about, but that's sort of the, the third part to it. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the we we try to design the story in this way that it's the the story that needs to take place, like we're doing any kind of immersive experience. That it needs to the the physical nature of the the sets that you're walking through, they are designed to tell the story. Um, so it's not just a story that's set in the spaceship. It's like every element of it is designed to propel the story and the mood of everything. So we start in a very industrial space, and then we move into a more studious space, and and then we go into an off-world alien adventure um and so it, it, the the whole kind of space evolves as you go through it but from a design point of view we try to design it so that we have you're on board when you get to the ship you're on board the ship with the azimuth um but that ship is designed so that we have um very obvious and it's leaning on the tropes that we all know and love of sci-fi so like i say there's nostalgia in there but when you go through each area each area is designed to feel very different in color scheme and mood and tone but they still want to feel like they're part of the same ship they're still made by the same company um so we have like industrial areas and we have the the more technical areas um and then we have more reflective abstract areas but they all feel like they're part of the same ship but very different in time and tone and design um, and one of the things we did to try to make sure this feels not just different in each area, but um, to feels like it is a genuine alien experience is that we've designed our own alien language um, that runs through the experience um, with its with two or three different um, uh, pieces of typography, how we can reference that language. Um, and that language is called Box and it's um, a genuine language um, where it's not just replacing characters with a with a typeface. We have a tool that we de we developed where you you put your English or your French or whatever version of the the curatorial story you're putting in there, and it spits it out into this alien language um, which has um, four thousand unique um, words in there, um, and then that is then use the, the the various different typefaces that you see around the ship to then represent that and so the typeface and the typography design is there to help give the idea that you're in a big industrial area or you're in the more scientific area so big bold versions of it or we have a very thin version of it that's in the lab um, but they're all kind of put in a place where that we wanted to make it feel like oh that looks like we're in somewhere big quite alarmist very industrial but we don't necessarily want people to spend too much time reading that and trying to understand that because we're at the same time we're balancing actual signage we're balancing actual things where we want to be telling people we don't want to bombard people too much with too many signs to read but at the same time visually you do want to bombard them because you're on a spaceship there's lots of signage lots of icons so it's a mixture of trying to make things feel genuinely alien so you know that that's just visual you get the mood of it um, but then we could still have on top of that. So we'll have like English translations on some of the things to where the, the ship's guide, the computer that has generated the whole thing has converted certain things into English to help illustrate to the, you know, the current crew that's on the ship. 
Can I just ask you about the language, Gavin? How did you design it? How did you come up with it? Was it kind of a a, a quick thing, or did it take you weeks and weeks? Um, I don't want to say it was quick. I don't want to say it was weeks and weeks. Somewhere between the two, <laughs> it was. It was. It was not. It was never part of the plan. It was just an I mm. had a bit of a folly, an idea. I thought, I wonder. I wonder if I can make an alien language. How, how how do you do that? And you know, after a few Google searches and a few hours later, I kind of worked out how to do it. So it's there's tools out there. There's a website, a tool that I use to do it. Um, there's quite a few of them out there, but um, the basics is it's a a tool that is used by kind of LARP designers and fantasy um, writers to a tool that. It, which is a, a shortcut to making your own fantasy language. Um, but it's extremely detailed and very technical as far as you can tell it exactly the type of tonality you want. Um, you can tell it what nouns to use, what nouns not to use. Um, you can tell it to make sure to include certain things. So we made sure we included within the 4,000 words that it's generating, we have definitely the words that we want to use. But because 4,000 words isn't everything. When you do translate it, some things do stay in English, but because we're in the alien typeface, it all looks alien. We didn't want to, we wanted to make sure that every word, like the word cargo in cargo bay, maybe only two characters in the alien language. So it's, to, it looks very alien. But so we used that tool to make that. Then I found another, another way to then make a web interface to make it to automate that because even though we're making the tool there's many different vendors and people that would be then having to use this language so i made a web interface to be able to then just paste your english or your whatever language that you're going to be working in because this show tours around the world for five years right so it's all been designed to be adaptable um so it's all, all a lot of the signs will need to be changed but um that was the the idea so then we made that and then like i say then we have a a, a designer that we worked for a few times before a graphic designer that's designed the typefaces um itself for it to then make sure the typeface that we use to represent the characters feels genuinely alien um doesn't look like any earthly language um which is a hard thing to do because there's a lot of them a lot of um, a lot of um, ways of written languages around the world. Um, so we did a, quite a lot of work on that. Um, and that's how we did it. I, I feel like it's, uh, sorry, I'm just going to, I feel like it, I want to say that, you know, that, that, the, that the underlying thought behind even inventing the language is, is, is kind of, it was very integrated into the whole, into the kind of the, high, the higher concept that we, um, that we kind of brought to, um, to the story, which is, uh, you know, it's a it is a kind of, as Gavin says, almost a traditional uh, uh, science fiction trope. But it's the idea that we ourselves are being studied by a by an alien intelligence of unknown origin, and that sort of felt like to us like that was a that was a particularly good story solution to the you know the objectives that the science museum uh, had because it meant that in in a sense the whole exhibition was set up um, with a character. Or uh, you know, uh, um, uh, an alien uh, who was trying to understand us in exactly the way that the science museum was creating the exhibition as a means of trying to understand something about ourselves. Obviously, very specifically, that is, um, what is the connection between science fiction and actual science? You know, why why is there such a thing as science fiction? What's, what does it even mean? Why, why, what's the purpose of science fiction? And to an alien intelligence with no familiarity with the kind of, with, with, with humanity or the history of, of, um, of human culture, that to them can, could feel like a kind of, you know, a, a big question. Uh, uh, and the, the, you know, the, the concept in some ways is that throughout the, the galaxy or the universe, the other places that this intelligence has visited, uh, they were always able to study and identify um, the, the science that um, that uh, the other um, organisms, other life forms, have come up with. But with but with humanity, there's this odd addition. There's this strange notion that there's also fictional science, science that isn't true at all. It's kind of almost it's it's antithetical to the seemingly antithetical to the actual notion of science. So the to get back to the to the starting point, the reason for having this language in the first place is to you know really convincingly create this notion that there is a, a a different intelligence, not a human intelligence, and that intelligence is studying us. It's looking at us, and it's it's created this whole ship, this whole setup as a way of studying us. 
fascinating. I should add that I haven't been in the experience yet, but I now, listening to you guys talk about it, I'm dying to get back over to London to try it out and be analysed by aliens. <laughs> um, yep. Lauren, I wanted to ask you about the team on this. Obviously, um, you all worked on it, but people might be curious about how big the team was, um, whether it contracted or got bigger as the project went along. How did you bring together the right people to work on this? It's actually a fairly small core team for a frame store project, I think. Um, so Henry, Gavin and I were sort of the, the main three leads throughout it. Um, we worked through um, a, an architectural process called the Reba process, which is a quite formulaic process of, of, of how design for a physical space is undertaken. And so working through that process meant that we brought in different people at different times to sort of expand and contract the team. So, for example, at the start, when we were doing the conceptual work, we were working with the art department and to visualize some of the, you know, the initial ideas for the project. Um, and then, as Gavin mentioned, we brought in specific graphic designers with experience of working on typography when working on the alien language. Um, Henry took on the monumental task of, of writing the narrative and the script for the, the AI guide, this character that we created to, to work through. And then the team expanded greatly as we moved further into production and that was led by the Science Museum. So there's a, a number of contractors working across it. So we had various different media vendors, interactive vendors, lighting, sound, um, AV hardware, design and build. So, I mean, by the end of the project, I'm, I'm not sure I could count the number of different companies that were involved in realizing the vision. Um, what was so fantastic was the Science Museum kept us involved as the creative team through pretty much every single decision that needed to be made so all this work was going on inside and you know gavin the the list of questions that gavin was getting daily from every single element you want <laughs> Just... to know that you want to know the color of the hinge in the third room yeah i can tell you the color you say kept him involved i mean or kept us involved gavin was 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 there the night before it opened painting yeah. Set. <laughs> well, yeah, I was painting things. I was putting things on the walls. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, that's the fun thing about these type of projects. It's the slightly theatre nature of it runs up to the exciting of the opening day. It's like, you know, you can, it's not like uploading a file to a server and it's done. It's like, you know, you're kind of walking around and there's always little bits like, oh, they can snag there. Well, get the hoover out, clean that little bit there. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's a bit, it, the more it comes up to the, the, the opening night, um, or even the opening morning, you're there before it opens. It's like, it's all hands on deck and it's always like, you know, little bits here and there. And that's, that's the fun part of adding the little details at the end. I was actually so got, gonna... yeah, we've got, all... go ahead. Sorry, no, 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 I was going to say, cause we've got, we've gone all the way through from that initial conceptual, you know, idea right through and sort of finalizing the final details. And there are so many things when you're working into a physical space that makes it, you know, adds this layer of complexity that you wouldn't necessarily find working fully digitally or on media you know they'd just they'd just be a, well we're really sorry but we're gonna have to put a door there or there's a fire exit or we don't have power to that space or we're you know how can you rethink the narrative to deal with the fact that there now needs to be a fire exit through here so can we retrofit the story to adjust the set design and to, you know, can, can everything just get shuffled around to just deal with this, this physical element that we can't, you know, we can't not have to deal with, if that makes sense. Mm. And, and then because the, pro because the project tours, everything has to fit into shipping containers. So the entire exhibition is designed to break down the component parts and to fit into shipping containers and to be shipped and to be rebuilt elsewhere. And again, you know, maybe in the more traditional frame store projects that we do, we never have to think about that or, or ceiling heights or, you know, all these things that are just about adapting our narrative and our concept into a physical space um, that, that restricts us or, you know, redirects us maybe into a, into a slightly different application of, of the idea that we've had. Right. Interesting. I was going to ask each of you, as it, as you said, you were there along the way and you were doing last minute painting. And so I won't ask you what it was like first walking through the experience because you really know that so well. But I am interested in what 
your reaction was to seeing others do it, perhaps, you know, children or mm. families doing that. Um, Henry, do you want to start us off with sort of your feeling of having worked on it, then seeing people go through? Uh, I don't think I'm a good person to ask this question. <laughs> I was, uh, I think uh, I, I went along and actually I didn't have the experience that Gavin did. I had the absolute opposite. I went on, I, I, I went on to a different project and was mm. de deeply involved in that in the last sort of, you know, in the last weeks. So I was kind of relatively, I suppose I had sort of relatively fresh eyes when I came to the actual experience, but I, just, I, I was completely, I mean, my head was in a complete blur. It was so kind of extraordinary to see all of the things that we thought about realized in this way. Um, I found it quite sort of, <laughs> it was very, it was a, it was a, you know, speaking very personally, it was a very odd mixture of like um, thinking, oh, wow, this is real. It's right in front of me and it's here and it's, sort of, you know, and I'm, I'm completely in it as well as sort of having my eye caught by all sorts of details and things that kind of, you know, uh, that, that, that completely distracted me but it was it it was very it was fascinating to go on the first um the night of the opening that the science museum laid on and to see uh, other people in the space and experiencing it and also to kind of you know just do a little bit of cheeky um earwigging overhearing what what people were saying and, and you know and frankly talking to people afterwards it was so interesting to see what you know the things that they had particularly observed or what had drawn them in or what um you know what had caught their their attention and it, it, you know it was it, and and the variety of responses was extraordinary i mean we get so focused on sort of concept and experience and thinking about guest experience but then there's a lot of, sort of practical elements that that we talk about a lot which is to do with throughput and the number of people that can fit in a room and you're you're not there's a, a period of the project where you're not necessarily thinking about people as as people who are in there actually observing and experiencing and feeding back on it, but you're thinking about numbers and making sure that you're going to get enough people through because ultimately there's a commercial element and you need to be able to sell tickets. And so we, you know, an, another parameter that we had to work to when we we're thinking about designing the experience was, can we get enough people through to meet the aims of the, of the science museum to be able to pass enough people through the exhibition, the, the length of time they're going to spend not creating bottlenecks and things in, in the experience design. And so, yeah, it, for me, it was bringing together, you know, we think of people conceptually and as, as them having this experience, and then we think of them as a set of numbers. And, and for me, it was just really interesting to see it all just come together and just see people like flowing and moving through the space. And from that opening night, I, I stood in a slightly dark corner in one of the larger rooms for quite a long time, just, just watching people milling through and talking and eavesdropping and things. And I'm not quite sure what they thought of me <laughs> particularly, but I, I think, yeah, I probably spent over an hour just in, in one of the, the key rooms, just, just watching people move through and sort of feeling how they're experiencing it. I think I was like watching, like as the getting nearer to the launch, watching different groups go through it as well. So we had different experiences and it was every time I was quite nervous watching them go through. I mean, the first wave was journalists and people come through to review it. And so that's like one level of like watching them, but they're very intently doing it and everyone's got a different kind of angle, what they want to do on it. But the main thing I was interested in was just waiting to see those actual guests walk through and um, the first guest that came through there was a slight technical hiccup in one of the rooms near the end of the experience that we were in trying to fix last minute as as you do something always goes wrong last minute and um we've we just got this the the effects um fixed again there was like a somebody literally lent on a button that they shouldn't have lent on a button basically previously um that's now been fixed they can't lean on it anymore but it was like okay had to fix this thing and literally fixed fixed it as i saw the first two guests just wander into this room and we're all casually standing there like oh we've just been in this room for a while just casually not panicking at all <laughs> um so those are the first two guests i come through and they were completely calm and casual and taking it all in so that was great but then I guess the other thing was just going through, it seems to what Lauren's saying, just kind of like earwigging on what people are saying and how they're exp um, experiencing it. And it all actually kind of worked out well. They just kind of, um, they just, um, people seem to interact with things in the way they we kind of planned it. Like one of the key things was there was somebody, I heard someone say in the, because there's a shuttlecraft you get into when you first go into the exhibition, you go into, you go into the, the departure lounge, you get your ticket for an off-world experience, and you go through into um, into the shuttle to launch off to 
to board with the the Asimov that's in low orbit. Um, so I just heard somebody in the shuttle saying like, oh, it's like I'm in a theme park. It's like, yes, we did our job. <laughs> you know, you, you, so they, they did that. So that was great. And then there's elements like later on where we have like this, um, there's an element where uh, a surprise mission where you have to go down to an alien planet, um, which is designed to be a very different experience to the rest of the whole show. It's there's no objects in there. It's very ethereal. Um, and it's um, seeing people in there, like laying on the floor, just staring up at the space that we've made, just taking it in or seeing kind of people playing with it, having fun in there. Um, exactly the different things were. So it was like it was like like I say, nervous, but then when you see it all work and you see the guests doing exactly what you want, we plan for them to do, you hope for them to do, there's only so much you can plan. And we did the testing, we had like the, some of the, the um, a lot of the the, um, the volunteers at the museum, there's like a whole army of volunteers at the museum that aren't aware of the project. So we have those kind of come through first and they did it and they did what we wanted them to do. But it's, you, you know, you know, they're kind of like slightly trained in how to do these things. So yeah, it was like I say, nervous but very rewarding to see. You know, okay, people understand it, and that it worked. And the, and the experience is designed for people who interact or will interact at different levels as well. So we we have to think about those different audience types when we're designing experience like this. So not everybody is going to go through and interact with absolutely everything or stand and read every single label. That you know, there are there are different levels of engagement that people will just naturally do depending on who they are and how they experience experiences like this. So even way back at the conceptual design, we were having to think about that. What happens when somebody is going to spend 45 minutes just kind of meandering through compared to somebody that will go through and read absolutely everything? And how do we create an engaging and entertaining experience for all those different types of people? Um, so it's, it's again, it's finding that balance where you don't go too far in one direction or another, that it, it becomes not interesting or you know too detailed for somebody almost film like in the way that we were trying to and I think this what probably goes back to the original question of why we were involved in it is that trying to trying to actually give a cinematic experience because it's obviously quite a cinematic world in a real in a real live space like for example we were trying to have big reveals of certain props there's like you know there's a you know um Starship Enterprise in there, for example, and things like that, and Darth Vader's helmet, is, all those things are in there, but they're positioned in a way we deliberately block your viewpoints so that you, you have to come around a corner to see these things. And there's only so many corners you can have. <laughs> so it was trying to make sure that we have sometimes certain exhibits are positioned in a way so you can't see the one next to it and things like that. So the, because some exhibits are there to tell certain stories that they work as a group, but um, it's that kind of, it's similar to cinematic tropes to make sure that, you know, you want the big dramatic reveal of seeing Frankenstein when you come around the corner or the reveal of when you see, you know, this a satellite reconstruction. It's, but they're all positioned so that the lighting plays to them. So you go through a period of darkness and a period of light, things like that. So it's similar to the how you may think of doing a movie when you're editing, but it's trying to do edit, editing, cinematic editing in a physical space. It's kind of, I guess, one way of thinking about it. Yeah. I'm, and I think, again, just listening to you makes me really want to go and watch it. But now I do feel like I have a little bit too much inside knowledge. So I'm going to try and turn that off <laughs> and go to it and just Boilers experience here. it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Look, thank you so much for chatting to me about that, um, Henry, Lauren and Gavin. I really appreciate getting a different perspective on something Framestore has done. And once again, I say, I really can't wait to go and experience it. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Ian.